When you hear about jihadist terrorism, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Probably the attack on the World Trade Center in New York in 2001. Maybe the Bataclan in Paris. ISIS fighting savagely in Syria or Iraq. Boko Haram in Nigeria. In other words, we generally place jihadism in the Middle East, Africa, or Europe. But what if I were to tell you that it's high time to put South America on the map? Haven't you noticed that this vast region is almost always overlooked whenever this subject is discussed? Okay, that's normal. Jihadist activity has not been as intense there as in other areas, but what if I were to tell you that this could change? What if I told you that there is one Latin American country where jihadism already has a strong presence? Take a look. Caribbean jihadists. Why Trinidad and Tobago has become the capital of Daesh in the West. Jesus Christ is personified as a white man with blue eyes, and people hate white supremacy, says an imam under anonymity. Indeed, it's not Argentina, nor Colombia, nor Mexico. No, no. This time, we're going to talk about a small Caribbean nation that many analysts rate as the largest nest of jihadists in the West. I'm talking about Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago, a nation made up of two main islands off the coast of Venezuela, sits today in the crosshairs of international counterterrorism intelligence. This small country used to stand out above all for being a major exporter of oil and natural gas, which is why they have dedicated themselves almost exclusively to this since their independence. These days, however, it's no longer known so much for that, but for jihadism and for having one of the highest homicide rates in the Americas, which is saying something. In fact, Trinidad and Tobago has the second highest homicide rate in the Americas behind only only Jamaica, so that's saying a lot. And of course, at this point, I'm sure many of you are wondering how on earth did Trinidad and Tobago become the Western epicenter for jihadism? When did this drift towards Islamic fundamentalism begin? Is Trinidad and Tobago just the beginning of a jihadist wave in South America? Today, visual politic viewers, we are going to answer these questions and many more. Stay tuned. The Jihadist Genesis. As many of you can imagine, Trinidad and Tobago did not escape the fate of the European colonial empires. It was also under their control. Starting in 1592, with the first Spanish settlements, both islands passed through French hands and finally ended up under British control, becoming a major cotton and sugar producing colony. And so it remained until almost 400 years later, when in 1962, Trinidad and Tobago gained its independence from the United Kingdom and, as I'm sure many of you are already thinking, it didn't take long for new problems to appear for this fledgling country. As soon as Trinidad and Tobago gained its independence, its economy began to collapse due to the reduction in international demand for its main export products such as cocoa, sugar and citrus fruits. The unemployment rate soon reached 15% by the end of the 1960s and mass protests in the streets became commonplace. However, between 1973 and 1981, due to the Saudi oil embargo against the West, this small Caribbean nation benefited from the rising price in the oil barrel. The result? An oil boom that allowed it to improve the living conditions of its citizens. Nevertheless, when things with the Arabs got back on track and that boom ended in the early 1980s, the level of public spending the country had taken on suddenly became an unsustainable burden. And given the difference between imports and exports, it was a very similar story. Instead of saving anything, Trinidad and Tobago was spending all the money it generated from hydrocarbons. And so, when oil and gas prices fell, the country's economy went into recession and by 1989, the society was in a desperate situation. Unemployment at around 22% and youth unemployment at 43%. To make matters worse, the government had to cut the subsidies it had created during the good times. Mass protests were inevitable and social unrest was more evident than ever. The country was almost at its limit and, in the end, in 1990, something happened that typically happens in young countries with weak institutions. A coup d'etat took place. But it was not another typical coup d'etat carried out by the military, nothing of the sort. This particular coup d'etat was carried out by none other than a radical Islamist group, the Jamaat al muslimin That's what I said, and in the middle of South America. This group, founded in 1982 by this man you see on screen, Yassin Abu Bakir, a former police officer who converted to Islam, attempted a coup d'etat in July 1990. Abu Bakir already had problems with the central government when he occupied land that had been granted to the confraternity of Islamic missionaries of the Caribbean and South America. In fact, in 1985, he was arrested for not complying with a court ruling ordering him to vacate the land, and in 1988, the government decided to carry out a series of raids there. 34 members of the organization were arrested for robbery, rape, and murder, among other crimes. Abu Bakir and his followers 
followers felt that the government was oppressing them and were not about to accept it. Thus, taking advantage of the tremendous social unrest caused by the crisis, on the 27th of July 1990, 112 Islamist rebels seized both the parliament and the offices of Trinidad and Tobago Television. The country was plunged into chaos and looting soon began. As a result, six days and 24 deaths later, the rebels gave up and surrendered with the government's promise to grant them amnesty. This rebellion is to say the only Islamic religious insurgency that the West has had. Since then, successful governments have adopted austere reforms without much concern for radical Islamism. However, in recent years, it has become clear that this was a mistake. Check it out. Fertile ground for extremism. Over time, countries forge their own reputation and image in the eyes of the rest of the world. Some countries are known for exporting a lot of oil, such as Saudi Arabia and Brazil, while others are known for leading the world economy, such as the United States and China. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, however, its reputation has been forged by news items like these. Three accused of plotting attack on New York's JFK airport arrested. Four people arrested in Trinidad and Tobago over carnival terror threat. Even so, this news does not come close to matching the most alarming fact about Trinidad and Tobago, which is that it's the country with the highest rate of jihadists per capita. In fact, being a country of barely 1,300,000 inhabitants, it's estimated that between 130 and 240 of its citizens joined Daesh in Syria and Iraq. To give you an idea, from the United States, about 250 joined Daesh, despite the fact that Uncle Sam's population is almost 360 times that of this small Caribbean nation. And you may be wondering, how on earth is this possible? Well, very simple. First of all, naturally, because of the financing of the global jihad, which usually comes from Saudi Arabian donors. However, the country's socioeconomic circumstances also play an important role. In fact, most of those who have joined Daesh in Trinidad and Tobago meet three very specific characteristics. They are men of African descent of about 35 years of age who have suffered discrimination, men who have come from a context of poverty, and people who have often been in jail. Yet, in Trinidad and Tobago, the recruitment of jihadists and their expansion has been particularly straightforward for one specific reason, the existence of a well-established national network. To give you an idea, the country's intelligence investigations discovered that there was a recruitment network that extended throughout the island of Trinidad. At the center of this network is this gentleman, Imam Nazim Mohammed. Mohammed has consistently denied his relationship with Daesh, yet the data indicates otherwise. For example, 70% of all fighters in the country who joined Daesh live near or within the religious community over which Mohammed presides. And not only that, some 15 members of his family also joined Daesh in Syria and Iraq, including his own daughter and grandchildren. On top of all that, as if it were not enough, he is related to Emran Ali, the husband of one of his granddaughters and who was sanctioned in 2018 by the United States for financing ISIS. So, as you can see, Trinidad and Tobago seems to have become an unexpected breeding ground for international jihadism. And I know what you're wondering, why this country? Well, you see, the language of the Trinidadians is English, an asset that served Daesh to increase its spread. But also because Daesh is aware of the harsh living conditions in the Caribbean nations. And well, if we consider that in Trinidad and Tobago there is no law prohibiting joining the Caliphate, and up until Brexit, Trinidadians could freely enter the United Kingdom and from there the rest of Europe, one can understand the attraction that the country has had for global jihad. With all this, it's not surprising that the United States has begun to take an interest in this small Caribbean nation. In fact, in 2017, Trump already met with the then Prime Minister of the country, Keith Rowley. At the meeting, they pledged to fight against terrorism in the islands in a reinforced way by creating a new surveillance system. However, analysts warn of one thing. The case of Trinidad and Tobago may just be the tip of the iceberg. Many predict a rise of jihadism throughout South America. But how true is this? Well, let's take a look. A new problem in Latin America? Those of you watching us or coming from South America probably think of guerrilla groups such as FARC in Colombia or Shining Path in Peru whenever the topic of terrorism in the region comes up. And that's hardly surprising. After all, jihadist terrorism in the region has almost been always anecdotal. In fact, we have to go back to the 1990s to find the two major jihadist attacks in Latin America. That of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires in 1992 and that of the Association Mutual Israelita Argentina, the AM 
MIA in 1994. And do you know who is responsible for these attacks? An old acquaintance, Hezbollah. You see, in 2006, the late prosecutor Alberto Nisman and his deputy Marcelo Martinez Abergos presented the report of their investigation into the 1994 AMIA bombing. The report directly accused the state of Iran of being the main architect of the attack and Hezbollah of having carried it out. However, this would not be the only occasion on which Iran and its Lebanese terrorist arm Hezbollah have been active in Latin America. Ties with Venezuela have also been repeatedly highlighted. Through anti-American rhetoric, Iran has curried favour with Venezuela in order to more easily exploit the region's Muslim communities. Indeed, the Cartel of the Sons, led by Venezuelan congressman Diosdado Cabello and the Lebanese cartel, created by Walik Maclid, and which has close ties to Hezbollah, have repeatedly collaborated by sending arms and narcotics to Damascus and Tehran via flights on Venezuelan airline Conviasa, a practice known as aeroterrorism. Yet, despite the infamous role that the Venezuelan dictatorship plays in the entry of Hezbollah, onto Latin American territory, the reality is that this is not the main entry point for jihadist terrorism into the region. For that, we have to move further south to an extreme hotspot for organized crime, the triple border. The triple border is the point where the borders of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay meet, a point where corruption of customs officials, poor border controls, and money laundering is the order of the day. Here, organized crime organizations from Latin America and other parts of the world are involved in drug trafficking, human trafficking, and smuggling, among other crimes. And who else do you think also operates here? Indeed, Hezbollah. And not just recently, it's been doing so since the 1980s. As a result, the free bordering countries, along with the United States, have carried out several security initiatives at this particular point, both to eliminate the presence of organized crime and jihadist terrorism. But so far, these strategies have not done much good, and the reality is that crime has intensified in this area. And can you guess which country is being hit the hardest? Well, none other than the largest and most populated country in Latin America, Brazil. Brazil has been reporting the presence of jihadist terrorists in its territory for more than a decade. In 2013, the country's federal police confirmed the presence of seven jihadist groups in national territory, among them Hezbollah, Hamas, and Al-Qaeda. In fact, in 2016, Brazil was on the verge of being the victim of a jihadist attack. Brazilian police arrest 10 people suspected of planning terrorist attacks for Rio de Janeiro Olympics. And in 2023, Brazilian authorities have warned of the start of a campaign within the country by Tablighi Jamaat, a centuries-old Islamic movement founded in India that has been in the crosshairs of world intelligence. What's more, they have been linked, in fact, to Al-Qaeda and to the Madrid bombings of 2004. As you can see, for the moment, there have been no new jihadist attacks in South America since those that occurred in the 1990s in Argentina. But tension over the jihadist presence in the region is on the rise. Trinidad and Tobago is the best example of this. Many analysts now think that Latin America could become a new epicenter for jihadist recruitment. But what do you think? Do you think we will start to see jihadist attacks in Latin America? And will the United States take any steps to prevent the rest of the subcontinent from following the same path as Trinidad and Tobago? You can leave us your answers in the comments. And as always, if you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And of course, hit the little bell so you don't miss out on any of the latest news coming soon. Once again, thank you very much for being there. All the best and see you next time.